Welcome back to another great edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Christopher Brown. I am your host, Christopher Brown, and uh, this is another community spotlight edition on the show where we shine a spotlight on one of the great community organizations here in the great city of Calgary. And today I couldn't have been honored and prouder to have in our guest. He is the president and CEO of, I want to make sure I get this title right because I've been screwing it up every time I've practiced this, Big Brothers and Big Sisters of Calgary and Area. <laughs> Mr. Ken Lima Coelho. Ken, thank you so much for doing this. My honor and my pleasure. Chris, thank you for having me. I'm a, uh, I, I'll say, longtime listener, first time caller. Woo! Uh, <laughs> thrilled, to, thrilled to meet you on uh, not walking in, in my neighborhood with my earbuds. It's thrilled to meet you here on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Well, Ken, I am honored to have you on because I think your organization is one of the good ones. I'm not saying that there's not other good ones out there, but I, I, I know Big Brothers and Sisters. I followed it through my career in politics and through my career in journalism. So I and I have family members who have gone through the system who have been mentors. So I'm so honored to have you on the show to talk about what your organization does for here in Calgary and the area. And I want to clarify what the area is later on. But I want to start with the very first question in the series, and that is, what is and who is Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Calgary and area? Well, uh, I will say, first of all, thank you for having me. Second of all, Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Calgary and area is my newfound passion. I'm kind of a passionate guy, and I've lent myself to a whole bunch of interesting causes and opportunities through a great career. You and I share a journalism background. Um, some people might know this voice from my time on the CBC, but currently, and I'm thrilled to be the new CEO. So lower your expectations, people. I've only been in this chair about five months, but I'm learning quickly. Uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters of Calgary and area is one of 108 different Big Brothers Big Sisters organizations in this five prime country of ours. Uh, the charity has been around for over 100 years. Um, you know, mentoring is, is our focus. I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. But yeah, we've been an organization for over 100 years in this community. We've served for about over 40 years. Um, and our organization right now is a bit of an amalgamation of some different mentoring charities that came together. Some people of a certain age might know the term aunts and uncles at large. That was uh, you know, an agency, there are a couple of agencies that were absorbed a number of years ago into Big Brothers Big Sisters. But really the concept has remained the same. We are committed to matching children and youth, many of them, all of them facing adversity with a caring mental. So young people are facing adversities that, you know, that put them at risk of not reaching their full potential. We, uh, we come together and more than ever, mentoring is really critical. It's a, it's, it's a need to have to make sure those young people that are on a, a challenging path for whatever reason, uh, find a, a trusted relationship outside their own family unit or guardianship uh, and can um, just get a sense of their community, a sense of where they fit in, uh, make friends and, and frankly, find a path forward and, and explore their possibilities. So we're about, if we, the most simple way to put it is we're beyond ice cream. Sure, we'll take a kid for ice cream and we'll have a good conversation with them. We have hundreds of volunteers, we'll get into that and, and hundreds of young people that we serve. But really more is going on than just an activity at Heritage Park or you know a, a walk in the mountains or playing video games on a couch. There's, there's something more sophisticated going on for the kid, it's just a lot of fun. But for the agency and, and the volunteers that we uh, were supporting those kids, there's some pretty interesting stuff happening that helped them on a good path. Now, before we talk about the actual mentorship and the program, I want to uh, stick to the actual agency for a little bit here. And I want to talk, while you were relatively new in the position, you are right, you were appointed, if I'm not mistaken, uh, November you took over, but the announcement came in uh, October of last year. You were taking on a position during a, a very unusual time. COVID-19 mm. is coming to an end. Uh, so I, I, while I want to talk about the future, I want to talk about the last two years. And I know you are new in the position, but how has Big Brothers and Big Sisters Calgary and area handled COVID? And has it affected the volunteerism and the actual uh, the programs that you were able to offer due to the social distancing and the restrictions that were in place? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a fair question. It's a fair question for every single one of us. Um, when it comes down to Big Brothers, Big Sisters, I'm very proud to say, of course, we were affected, you know, um, because we're really about relationships. And, uh, you know, often they're one on one and they're, they're personal connections. 
And to a large extent, they're out in the community or they're in schools or, you know, uh, uh, they're, in, you know they're face to face, they're, they're 3D. Now, of course, we couldn't do that for a while, <laughs> none of us. Uh, so what did that look like? You know what, it looked like innovation. Here's why I'm proud of the team. I'm proud because many of the volunteers, most of the volunteers stayed with us. They weren't going, to, they have committed to these young people. We look for a minimum of 52 weeks commitment with our, our, our volunteers and they're thrilled to do that. I can talk about how, why that doesn't sound, shouldn't sound as scary as it does as a commitment. Um, but our volunteers, they stayed with us. We've lost very few. In fact, we gained some wow. in that period, uh, but the, the, the relationships look different. Suddenly you weren't going for a walk, uh, maybe until it was safe to do, but you were playing games online or you were playing Minecraft together, or you were doing a cooking thing, one in your kitchen and one in their kitchen. We also stood up brand new programs. Chris, I'm really proud to say this. I actually had, so 48 hours ago, I was in, in, in community, in a, in a room uh, at a community hall with about 25 um, um, seniors. Now these seniors are part of our program called Between Generations. And in normal times, those are, you know, 55, 60, 70, or right up to our oldest is 82 years old, uh, mentors that go into schools mostly, and they connect with young people there. And they have conversations, and they read together, and they do crafts, and they do a bunch of great things. And it often it happens either in the community or, like I said, in the school setting. Well, that couldn't happen. Obviously, we had vulnerable kids. We also had vulnerable seniors. We weren't going to put them together. So what did we do? We got creative, and we got smart, and we did it quick. Remember the pen pal? Chris, did you ever have a pen pal? I, 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 I apologize to my pen pal. I think it was in either Germany or France in grade two. I stopped writing to them after they wrote to me four times. If you're listening, person who I've forgotten your name, sorry. <laughs> well, here's the good news. The pen pal uh, became uh, a, a tool for us. So we had these seniors connecting with young people in the same way they were, but different. Now they were writing letters to each other. And I got to tell you, I was chatting with these, uh, we did a paint night the other day with, uh, with our volunteers, the, the senior volunteers, just to say thank you for all their, all their flexibility over the time. And so we were painting together and laughing and telling stories. And a bunch of them probably pulled out their letters. I wish I had one with me, but they, they wouldn't give them to me. They're so special to them. And the young people had written to them and there were stickers all over it and hopes and dreams. And this was an opportunity. Three things were happening right there. The older people had an opportunity in a time of isolation to connect with those young people in a safe way. The young people had an opportunity to connect with their mentor in a safe way, work on their literacy skills, do something as exciting as putting an envelope in the mail and sending it and receiving one back. You, know, you remember how exciting it is to receive mail with your name on it, not mom, dads, or guardians. And the third thing that happened was our agency kept things moving and we kept those connections happening so whether it was on a zoom call like this or a, a phone call or a, a letter exchange back and forth or when it was safe a uh, safe outside walk or now coming back into sort of more normal activities we kept going uh, an agency that's as as um, wholesome and experienced as us oh we don't let a little pandemic uh, take us down we will uh, we will navigate and we will adapt and oh, there's that word, we will pivot, but we will. And we did. Now, adapting to a global pandemic is one thing. The, prog the process of getting through the pandemic is another thing. And now we are, um, knock on wood, I'm hitting every single piece of wood that I possibly can think of right now, but we are we are out we are not completely gone. We're not completely out of COVID-19, but restrictions are lowering. Are you returning to those traditional mentorship roles that we'll talk about after you answer this question? And are you uh, returning back to some of those traditional ways of how Big Brothers and Big Sisters has run, but also keeping in mind that some people might not want to go back to that. So we have to adapt and be sort of a dual organization now of people Absolutely. wanting to be online and pivoting. Yeah, yeah, we are. We are certainly returning. Now we didn't go headlong in. I mean, we're smart enough to know that uh, the science can change. Yes, we follow the science and uh, the science can change on things. So we've taken baby steps. For instance, we're still about a month away from you know, full reintegration into 
one-on-one uh, -on -one or you know community connection in person. Some of that is happening. The other day, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. We have a, a small office here in Southeast Calgary. And uh, I was walking, we've got some, some rooms around the back, sort of small multi-purpose rooms. And generally that's where conversations are had with parents or we need to do intake, uh, what we call enrollment interviews with young people to learn more about them. That's where we interview volunteers and have chats. Well, those rooms were empty for months and months and months. And everything I described was happening online. I gotta tell you, my heart, heart filled up a bit because 48 hours ago, I went to actually have a, a quick little meeting with two or three of our teammates. And I thought, well, let's not do it in my office. Let's go into one of those breakout rooms. They were all full. There was uh, a mentoring coordinator, one of our staff that, that works with uh, mentors talking with a mom. Uh, her kids were, three of them were playing a game in one of the rooms across the way. There was uh, two other people meeting. And I think it could look like it was a new uh, volunteer that was kind of, kind of getting onboarded. So these things are starting to happen. Just tonight, I'm actually going to a mentoring event where we have about, I think there's about 18 people, so nine matches that are going to be, it's another paint night. We're, we're obviously big on paint night. And they're doing a paint night tonight. Um, so we'll be in person. But some of the training we're doing, still online. Some of the mentoring and matching and, and communicating we're doing, still online. Some people are doing a mix, some people are full back, depending on what their circumstance is, what vulnerabilities might be in, you know, in their health situations or whatever. You know, like I said, we are a nimble enough agency that we can adapt to whether it's full online for a particular match. We do what's right for the kid and we do what's right for their big. The littles and the big sort of drive the agenda for us. And if they, you know, if they're having a great time gaming with each other and they're still forming what we call a developmental relationship, great, let's go with that. But if they really need those in-person pieces, we've got great partners that give us tickets to the Flames game or an opportunity to go to, uh, you know, to iFly and, you know, uh, uh, do that uh, indoor, um, what, what parachute or parachute, yeah. <laughs> parachute jumping, or they want to play laser tag or whatever that looks like, we have the opportunity to do that too. And like I said, a lot of what we do is one-on-one, -on -one, but not necessarily. Sometimes there's group and ma uh, match opportunities so bigs and littles can get together with other bigs and littles and have a great time. So it's a mixture. Uh, will it remain a mixture? Probably. You know, that pen pal program I told you about, it's not going away because it's successful. And in fact, we're now going to build an entire literacy strategy that has other elements of literacy around it. Because if kids are reading and they're writing, and that's part of the mentoring relationship, let's lean into that. So we've got some partners that we're talking to and looking at to see if we can expand that once we've built the strategy. So we're, we're getting smart, but we're also being careful. Come celebrate Calgary's favorite cocktail. Calgary Caesar Fest is taking place on May 19th and 20th right here in the birthplace of Canada's official national cocktail. As listeners and viewers of the cross-border interviews with Chris Brown, you will receive 20% off your tickets when you use the promo code CBI Caesars. That's C-B-I Caesars, all one word. Just visit CalgaryCaesarFest.com and get your tickets today. We've talked about the organization. Now let's talk about the major program. And I say major program because it's the it's the kind of the poster program of what Big Brothers and Big Sisters sure. is, and that is the mentorship program where a volunteer uh, applies. And I'm assuming uh, they go through the process, uh, like you said, through one of those breakout rooms, and they get interviewed and they do background checks. What is it to be a mentor and what does it mean to be a mentor for the Big Brothers and Big Sister program in Calgary? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, first of all, that intake program is important for us. Um, and we're diligent. We're diligent. There's, I mean, it's, we don't want to put up barriers for people. We want to invite you know, uh, volunteers and adults that want to be a part of our program. But uh, we do make sure that they're a good fit. We make sure that they, they would be safe and that they're open to the trainings that we offer. Um, and many, many are, but I'll be honest with you, we recruit a whole bunch of people. Some people just kick the tires a little bit and go, no, that's not quite for me, but that might be a good thing for my friend. Um, and so not everybody that, that gives me a call and says, I want to be a mentor ends up being one. 
but that's actually okay because sometimes we're not at the right moment for everything because we're asking for a, a pretty significant commitment. With the young people that we serve, um, a consistent and caring relationship is one of the most important things. What does that look like? We actually look for a minimum of one year commitment. So 52 weeks, uh, you know, uh, an hour to three hours a, a week commitment. Now that sounds like a lot, but I gotta tell you, the volunteers tell us they get a lot back from this. They get, some say that I get more out of it myself than I feel like I give to my young person. But what does it look like? Well, we put them through their paces a little bit to make sure that they're safe. Then there's this beautiful matching process. What it is not is, hey, there's a kid that needs a, a mentor in this bucket and there's a volunteer in this bucket. Yeah, that looks good, send them on. No, we take a look and we have these these guided interviews, so we have conversations with both the little and their family, as well as the big, to understand what their life experience and their lived experience is. Um, um, I was chatting with one of my colleagues, Jody um, McKay, who's the manager of experience and engagement here, knows everything there is to know about mentorship. And she was talking about one mentor, uh, that uh, potential mentor, that said, well, I'm not sure I'd be a good fit because I've struggled with depression in my life. And what her answer was, was, well, now that's interesting because some of the young people that we connect with, there is, you know, mental health issues in their lives or in their family or in themselves. You've got lived experience that actually could be a very powerful opportunity to connect with those young people. And so that's not a detriment, that's actually an asset. So we make those decisions and we, and we have conversations. You know, what are you into? If you're, a, if you're the kind of person that will do that crazy uh, parachute jumping thing, I'm not one of those guys. I have other, other you, you, you neither, it looks like. But there are some people that are a bit daredevilish, and there's a few kids that are like that too. Well, suddenly we start to see we're cooking with gas on a match thing. So we, we do a very intentional process to match. What are we looking for? Well, ultimately, we're looking for a successful relationship. It's, um, it's, a, it's an opportunity for those young people and a trusted adult to connect. And there's five things that we're hoping that come out of that developmental school relationship. First thing. We want the, uh, the match to express care to each other. But particularly, we want that young person to say that, show me that it matters to you that I'm part of your life. I have to say, a lot of these kids, quite a few of the kids that we, we support are in care. Uh, they're in government care of some variety, uh, youth in care. And uh, not all, but, but, but some. And what's interesting is in their lives, everybody around them that is providing support, whether it's a teacher or a healthcare worker or social support worker, in a lot of ways, they're paid to be there. Whereas our mentors are volunteers. They're, they may be the one person in their life other than a parent or guardian that's not paid to be there. They're there because they want to be there. And they're doing it in a caring way and they're doing it consistently. So they're expressing care. Secondly, they're challenging the young person's growth. They're encouraging them to continue to grow. They're saying, why couldn't we try something that you've never tried before? Taking some healthy risks, that kind of thing. I want, I want to get, I want to get this clarification question out of the way because I think there's a lot of people out there who know about big brothers and big sisters, but there's one concern that they have about becoming a mentor. And I think you know where I'm going to go with this because I'm assuming yeah, it's it, the question well, everyone asks you as they come in. One to three hours a week, that's fine. I can do that. Like that's a great volunteerism. Like I could totally uh, supply that. The issue is. Is it going to cost me money? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be out of my pocket where in, uh, sometimes that's great. I could totally do that. But with the financial stress that a lot of people are in right now, and I can, we'll talk about fundraising a little bit later for the big brothers and big sisters, but does big brothers and big sisters Calgary and area help mentors help the littles in some sense? So it's not all financially on the backs of the big. That's an excellent question. And, and please know for your listeners, that this is not just inviting you into our agency and then us sending you out there and expecting you to pay for it all. We've got partnerships. One of our best partnerships is with Nikki Nash and her amazing team at Kids Up Front. Kids Up Front is a very simple mandate. They find the tickets that people have got and they give them to kids that need. Well, we're one of their best partners. So if a kid wants to go to a Roughnecks game or they want to go to a Flames game or they want to go to a Hitman game or they want to go to Heritage Park or they want to go see the Heebie Jeebies, that silly acapella group, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, instant commercial there. Hey, well, uh, I'll have you when, back on the show to talk about the heebie-jeebies <laughs> if you want there, Ken. <laughs> but when they want to do something like that, 
we have partners that will reach out or that we can reach out to and say, hey, um, give us some tickets for this. We've got a match that is interested in something like that. And frankly, organizations across the city are constantly connecting with us. Um, this, uh, just over Christmas time, I got a call from a radio station from a, a potential partner of ours that we're working with. And that radio station said, hey, we've got a client, it was a real estate company, that's got 200 tickets to Zoo Lights. Do you think your young people could use that? I'm like, yes, sir, we sure could. And that means 200 or 100 matches, both volunteers and their, their littles, their mentees, got to go to Zoo Lights, right? That's thousands of dollars in, in opportunities that they got to share. And But here's the other thing I want you to know, Chris. Sometimes it doesn't cost anything. It doesn't cost anything to go for a walk. No and hang out in nature for a little while. It doesn't cost anything to sit on a park bench and play a game or to-, to, uh, to Or to Zoom and have a game over Zoom. Absolutely. Uh, so sometimes there are, and, and we do ask, you know, if there are opportunities that, um, that a mentor and a mentee decide upon that might cost a few bucks. Yeah, there's some opportunity for that uh, mentor to invest in, in that opportunity, but there's no obligation. It's not, you must spend $150 a week on your kid. That's not what it's about. It's about creating those opportunities to try some new things, to have some fun. And here's the thing. We've got a whole team that is connecting in with both the volunteers <laughs> and the young people and their families to make those things happen. We have mentorship coordinators. We call them MCs. And, and they're in constant contact you know, uh, with the volunteers and also the families to make sure both sides of the relationship are really working. So you've always, you're a phone call or an email away or a text away from support. That's what our part of the agency is. We bring these matches together, but then we support them every step of the way. And that could be as simple as, hey, do you have any tickets to this thing on Friday? Or it could be, you know, I've encountered something in this young person's life that's going to need a little bit more support. Can you help? The answer is always yes. And then we figure it out. Uh, we've talked about the mentorship program, but I want to t talk about the intake about the from the littles perspective because. Sure. So this is my this is my knowledge of Big Brothers and Big Sisters showing here, and this is going to tell you how much I know, and this is why you've come into the uh, the role of being my guest on today's show. <laughs> from what I understand, a little or a person who uh, uses the uh, services of Big Brothers and Big Sisters, a family, uh, a child who uses the services, is a, chi is a child who has either lost a family member or loved one, and they are looking for a mentor to play that role so that way they can help in their development. Now, I'm assuming that's not the case in all scenarios where sometimes the uh, parents or guardians might be out of the picture, like traveling with work and all that all the time, and they can't get there so talk to me talk talk to me and answer the question who is considered a little for the big brothers yeah. and big sisters program it's a great question and that that answer is actually evolved remember i mentioned aunts and uncles at large mm -hmm. you know that so that historical organization many years ago was very much how you describe it you know there was an absence of a parent in the home due to some circumstance whether it was a broken relationship or you know someone passed away whatever and you needed that sort of uncle outside. Uh, there are still some elements of that in some of the relationships, but with us, it's evolved. It can be a whole bunch of reasons that a young person comes to us. Um, one of the, the study or the scales that we use to identify the needs of young people is called ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. Now there's a list of between 10 and 12 of these, everything from a death of a parent, like you said, or there could be mental illness in the, in the family or in, the, in the, the, the child's life. There could be some level of neglect, poverty. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's a whole list. And I, I imagine your listeners could probably close your eyes and kind of think about what, that, what might be on that list. Now, the young Please don't do that if you're listening to this in the car, please. That's right. not close, just, just for clarification. <laughs> you didn't sign the waiver, so don't do that. It's a good point. But when it comes down to those ACEs, those outward childhood experiences, uh, I'm going to give you a bit of a sobering stat, but then I'll give you the plus side. The sobering stat is in 2019, so pre-pandemic, about 60, 61% of the young people we served had four or more of those ACEs in their lives. Not just one, but four or more. Now that number, Chris, in 2022, um, it's 86% of 
of the young people that we serve have four or more. Now that feels like a very heavy story, but here's the good news. There are volunteers that want to serve them. So to answer your question on who these young people are, they come to us from a whole bunch of different ways. Remember, we serve from the age of six to the age of 24. So the whole definition of a little is actually quite broad. Quite so big. some, young, some you know, teenagers and older ad and younger adults, they come to us and say, I think I could use your services. I think I could use the mentor. Sometimes it's a school that is pointing out a child that could use our support. Sometimes it's another agency. We work with a whole bunch of social agencies in, in, and or all government care agencies, et cetera, that say out of all of the different kinds of interventions, this is one of them this young person could really benefit from. So they're coming to us in a bunch of different ways. Um, uh, but it, it, you know, traditionally it was that, you know, absentee father or mother or guardian in the relationship. Sure, there's still that in the complexion of what we do now, but it is much broader than that, which means there's much more opportunity. But here's what I want everyone to know. Sure, that sounds like it's, it's tough work to some of these young people, but boy, oh boy, the consistency of having that relationship, that trusted friend that they can connect with, that they can connect with in a different way than a parent or a guardian or a social worker or a teacher is magical and it's meaningful. And it's not just going for ice cream, we're changing their brain chemistry. Everything we do, Chris, is actually based on brain science. Now, I'm embarrassed to say even a few months in, I can't tell you too much about that because I'm not part of the amazing support team that's just outside this door that knows all that. They do hundreds of hours of training. They take a 30 hour course in brain science. They're constantly looking at the literature. We've got data and we measure well. All of the work that we do, we've got an evaluation specialist right on staff that is constantly measuring both qualitatively and quantitatively if we're moving the needle for these young people. And that's how we know when we go to funders, we don't just say, don't just take Ken's word for it. We've actually got data to back up that we're moving the needle for these young people and we're making these trusted relationships, these developmental relationships into something really special that sets them on a new course. So there's a whole bunch going on, even though they're just playing Minecraft. One last question on this topic, and I'm just cautious of time here, and then we'll hit their last uh, last topic and then we'll wrap it up here. But how can people become a little? How can people, or how can a family member who's looking at potentially enrolling get into being a little? And how can people become a mentor? And yeah. that's actually, there's, it's, there's going to be a follow up question to this because there's always a follow up <laughs> question to everything. But answer that, then I'll have the sure. really short follow up question. <laughs> I'll make everybody's life really easy. Obviously, the, the, the best way in is the website, bbbscalgary.ca, bbbscalgary.ca. Right there on the website, there's paths in both for both volunteers as well as young people. Or talk to a trusted adult in, in, in the young person's life, whether it's a school a teacher or a guidance counselor, we're a well-known agency. Uh, most every you know medical professional, psychological professional, social worker, uh, you know, teacher, uh, guidance counselor, those kind of folks know, know of us know how to find us. When it comes to the volunteer side, sort of same story. We're easy to find at bbbscalgary.ca. And right there on the website, we don't just give you a form that's 18 pages to fill up. We actually, uh, on, the, on the intake uh, of where it says volunteer, you'll actually see a journey. And it starts, Chris, with a conversation. It always starts with a conversation. You're gonna talk to one of our amazing beautifully trained staff that are caring and they really love what they do. And you're going to talk about why you need our help or why you want to help. And then we're going to make the process as simple as possible. We're constantly trying to remove barriers to either becoming a mentor or becoming a mentee. Now, there are processes, like I said, number one job is to keep those young people safe and to make sure that our outcomes are met um, so that they have a, they have a, you know, a good meaningful relationship. But we're going to try to make things easier. We're going to, we're always, always working on speeding things up because so the process is a little smoother. Uh, but like I said, it starts with a conversation and it's easy to find us, bbbscalgary.ca. So for those who've listened to the show before, you know what I'm about to say. The link to the website is in the show notes. The link to the Facebook, Twitter, all that, those handles are in the show notes as well. So please check them out. It's a great organization. The follow-up question to that uh, last question is this. What are the stats right now? 
Are you looking mm. for mentors? Is there enough mentors to go around? Are you in need for more people to come out and actually yeah. help? We have three needs right now. I'll be just authentic and vulnerable with you, especially as a new CEO. We need mentors. Um, even though, now this is kind of interesting, even though in some areas of our work, we've actually got a waiting list of young people. Here's why. We need mentors because, remember I told you it's not just first mentor in the door gets the first kid in the door? These these relationships have to match. They have to work well together. They have to form that bond. And that means we actually need a pool of volunteers willing to help. Because just because you're willing to help doesn't mean your, your match is ready to go right there and then. We need a pool of people, frankly, bigger than the pool of the littles we've got in order to draw from to find the really right fit and the right mix. So yes, we're constantly recruiting. I will let you know the second thing I want you to know is that we need more male and male identified mentors than we do females and female identified. That is not just contemporary to um, Calgary, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Calgary. That is, a, that is a, a challenge both provincially and nationally. We always want more. There are, um, we don't completely know the reason for that. There, I've got some, some, some thoughts and assumptions, but uh, what I know is that the, if, if you're a young man or a, you know, a male identifying, and please know we have two-spirited mentors, we have transgender mentors, we have the spectrum of humans because we're humans um, and we welcome all, uh, but uh, we do need more male and male identified mentors right now because there are a lot of young boys and uh, young people that identify as male that are looking for that male-to-male -male connection and um and and so that that's that's one opportunity the last thing i will say is it's not just about volunteering we're a charity we're a registered charity we need support about 50 percent of what we bring in right now is government support the governments at the municipal provincial and federal levels uh, find great value in what we do and we uh, and we help them do what they need to do for for citizens uh, across our uh, city and so they do invest in us in a variety of ways. But that's only half the picture. And that means um, guys like me get to beat the bushes in corporations, in individuals, in foundations. We do hold some special events and other things. We need your support. I'm asking for your support. And I'm not just going to do it on Chris's podcast. If you give me the opportunity, I will come to see you in your living room, your boardroom, or your bedroom. No, not your bedroom. Your ballroom. And we will... Uh, and we will ask for your support. And we have a good story. Horror fans unite. The Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown is pleased to offer a free audible copy of David Mercer's newest book, Living Death, A Love Story. The book is about Nick, who having suffered the horrible loss of his wife, plays the hero and rescues Jenny from her abusive boyfriend. Deciding that he has one last adventure in him, he invites her on a cross-country road trip. Little did they know that the world, as they knew it, was ending. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca to enter into the draw. Simply tell us your favorite horror film by April 14th and be entered. I think you are the king of segues because you have set up every single segment that I'm about to uh, <laughs> transition into so seamlessly, Ken. Um, You're a good teacher. Donations, donations, donations make charities run. As much as uh, it is struggling out there, charities are struggling as well. And Big Brothers and Big Sisters in Calgary and area is one of them. One of the major fundraiser drives that Big Brothers and Big Sisters uh, Calgary and area are, is holding right now is Jeremy's Big Run. Former counselor Jeremy yeah. Farkas is currently running from Mexico to Canada. God bless the man, because I think I would have looked at the map and I went, <laughs> heck no. Um, how did this come about? How did this fifty thousand now hundred thousand uh, dollar donation uh, challenge come about? You know, it's a really cool story. So I've known Jeremy. I, I worked. Uh, I've worked in community for many, many years. Previous to my role here, I was a senior executive at the YMCA, and I was in charge of government relations. So I've met him and all the other councillors and you know mayoral candidates all, along the way. And I get this kind of random call from Jeremy and. Remember, after the election in uh, October of 2021, he kind of vanished a little bit. I think he needed time to collect his thoughts and figure out what was next. 
And so he called me and when he called, I, I didn't know what it was about. And he said, it was actually a really interesting conversation. He said, Ken, um, I mean, I'm, I'm putting words in his mouth, but I'm between jobs right now. And I wanted to do something meaningful. And, he, and, he, and then he evoked the memory of his grandmother. Her name was Elizabeth. She passed away a number of months ago. And this, the family had not had the opportunity to honor their grandmother, his grandma, Elizabeth. Um, in the way that they hope, because of all the constricts, uh, um, the, uh, the challenges of COVID. And he said, I'm going to do something really off the wall. I want to do this great run, the Pacific Crest Trail. Like you said, it's, it's 2,600 miles, so almost 4,500 kilometers from the Mexican border right up through the Canadian border. Some rugged terrain and mountains and deserts and forests and just some crazy stuff. But he said, Ken, uh, my grandmother always taught me not to just do something, but do something for good. And so his idea was to honor her. He grew up in Southeast Calgary, uh, sort of Dover area. And there was a lot of important mentors in his life. And he gave me a sense of uh, Grandma Lizzie being the first among them. But she was a school teacher and she really embraced mentorship as well. And then he said, this made me laugh, it was classic Farkas. Jeremy said, and I used to read your government reports and they were very well done. And I'm quite impressed with you as a CEO. So why don't we team up? And I'd like to raise $50,000 through my network in support of your charity. What do you think? And I said, wow, what a coming out party for former candidate, Mr. Farkas. So we hatched this thing. I got to tell you, Chris, before he started running, we had a press conference to announce this. There was lots of splash on social media for obvious reasons, because he's a well-known guy. Before he even started running, We'd already raised the 50,000. So Jeremy said, forget this. We're not stopping now. Let's double it. As we record this podcast, we're at 65,000 and it's growing every day. And I think as Jeremy finishes this run, which will take over 100 days, like he's, he's, he's doing a marathon every day, uh, that total is going to go up and up and up. And he's ambitious for us. But here's the beautiful thing. Every time I talk to Jeremy, it's not about him. It's not even about his run. He wants to know how our agency is doing. How are the kids we, we're serving doing? What more can we do to help? And, that year, and I got to say, you might like his politics. You might not like his politics. But the way he's shown up for our charity has been pretty special. And I got to tell you, I've looked at the donor list. It is all over the political spectrum. And so that's a, that's a pretty meaningful uh, uh, opportunity. And I'm no fool. There's some brand value there for him. Uh, to break through and what he'll do with that next, we don't know. But when it comes down to it, he uh, has shown up well for us and he's really helped put our little charity on the map. There are 26,000 charities in this province and he chose us. Um, just to sort of timestamp this interview as it's coming out uh, on the 7th or the next Thursday, so whatever, April 7th, I believe it is. Uh, don't quote me on that if you're listening to this on a different day and it's not the 7th, but it's <laughs> the, the Thursday of the first week of April. Um, we are on day 19 of the run. You're saying this is 100 days. Um, while this is a great uh, endeavor, I'm assuming you would not like... Uh, turn away the 20 and $50 donations that people would come in and write a check for and say, you know what, I can't do what Jeremy's doing, but here's $20 or here's 12 tickets to this event. That is the lifeblood of what we do. I mean, it's cliche for a nonprofit CEO to say no donation is too small, but it's true. These add up. I mean, the donations we've seen from Jeremy's big run have been everything from 5,000 to, or uh, sorry, $5 to many more zeros than that. At the same time, if yeah, if somebody's got a, 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 a you know something that they like to give us, but I will tell you, I'll be honest with you, uh, there are better agencies to give your coats and your gloves and your mittens to. That's not what we do. All, all nonprofits have to start to stay in their lane, but we work and partner with those. So if you've got cash, we'd love to talk to you. If you've got tickets, sure, but maybe you go to Kids Out Front. We're not shy; they're going to come to us anyway. But really, when it comes to us. Those monetary donations, whether it's a one-time or, or a monthly donation, or even a major gift, which is something that we're passionate about uh, finding right now and recurring gifts and opportunities and sponsorships, or maybe you buy a ticket to our event. We do a great brunch every, to kick off the Christmas season called the Big Brunch every November. We're conceiving of a brand new event into uh, spring of next year of 23 uh, to really honor mentorship in people's lives. 
those are all opportunities to connect. But no dollar is too small because we can translate. I can tell you because we measure these things. For every dollar you give us, we can turn that into $23 in impact to society. One in 23 leverage, I don't care what business you're in, is a pretty good leverage. And we do that here at Big Brothers Big Sister. Well, Ken, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Um, for those who want to donate, whether it be that one-time monthly or one-time or monthly donation to Big Brothers Big Sisters Calgary and area, um, there's a link on their website. So if you haven't already, head over, click on the show notes, head over to Big Brothers and Big Sisters Calgary we website, donate, see if you're, you'd be a perfect match for mentorship, see if you potentially would be able to get a, a little into that uh, uh, program. and just learn about the great organization that they are. Ken, I want to thank you so much for taking time. I know I said a half hour, we're at the 45 minute mark, but I want to thank you because you, you helped clarify a few things, but also you you speak so passionately about the organization. And I hope that is uh, conveyed through people listening to this. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to connect with you, with your listeners and viewers. It's our opportunities like this that I, this is the reason I took this job. Uh, the work we do is important, it's meaningful, and it doesn't need to be complicated. A developmental relationship, that one relationship, supportive relationship in a child's life is the key to building their confidence and their resilience. And what more is important right, right now, after a pandemic, than resilience and confidence? That's what we need to do in society. That's what we do for kids. With that, uh, I'll give Ken the last word on that one. But thank you so much for listening. Uh, as I always say, uh, get off social media for five minutes and go have a conversation with somebody because it can actually help uh, our society and yourself and someone else while having a conversation. Ken said it best. Having a conversation does actually mean a lot in today's society. So put down the cell phone, go talk to somebody. Uh, but with that, uh, we will be back again for another great edition of the Cross Border Interviews tomorrow. Have yourself an excellent day, guys, and we'll chat later.